Hello and welcome everybody to the Builder Track. My name is Tatiana Bellendia and I'm a principal security architect at the Daimler Track. And today I'll be moderating this section. In the next 40 to 45 minutes, um, Sven Schleier and Carlos Oguera will present um, their talk. And at the end of the session, we'll have time for questions. Um, you can put your questions into the Kuva app pane, and we will address them at the end. The chat function in Zoom is deactivated for that indeed. Guys, I assume you will present yourself in the talk quickly. Otherwise, I can take it over. If um, you're good to go. Yes, we will be sharing ourselves. All good, Tatiana. Perfect. Then welcome and go for it. Thank you very much. Then, yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. And thanks for joining our talk today about Mobile Wanderlust, our journey to version 2.0. So first, let's just quickly introduce ourselves to everybody. So um, Carlos, you go first. Sure. Hello, everyone. This is Carlos Olguera. I am working for Now Secure, and I'm also the co-lead of the Mobile Security Testing Guide project from OWASP. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here with you and sharing the news we, we have for you today. So thanks, Sven. Okay, cool. So my name is Sven and um, I'm actually living in Singapore and I'm the technical director for WIF Secure in Singapore. I'm doing majority of pen tests. Of course, we're doing also mobile pen tests and I'm already being involved together with Carlos. I'm already for quite some time in the OVAS um, mobile security testing guide, um, also as a project co-leader. Okay, so to give you an overview about what we are planning to do today, so there are four topics roughly. Um, the first one is just to give you an overview about the mobile security project and the resources that we're producing as part of it. Um, just that we're all on the same page if the whole topic might be new to you. Um, then Carlos will be giving you an overview about Google's ADA and the, and the data safety section. So this is something um, pretty new and that we are pretty excited to share today um, with all of you. Um, then we go into the actual biggest chunk of the um, presentation for today, which is the OVASP MASVS refactoring process. So we just want to outline a little bit how the refactoring is going and um, also our thought process behind it. And then we conclude at the end with uh, Carlos, who will also be sharing a little bit more about OVASP MES and as compliance as code. So let's start first with the um, OVASP mobile security project and the resources that we are creating as part of this project. So we have three main deliverables of this project. So the first one is the mobile app set verification standard, which you can see here on the left. And this document, um, was actually not changing that much in the last six years since we since we started the project. So um, it's basically establishing, establishing the security baseline for mobile apps by um, having eight different domains and roughly 84 security requirements that are specifically for mobile apps. So this is this is touching in several areas like network, coding, data storage, for example. And this is really on a high level just outlining all the requirements that, for example, developers or also pen testers should be aware of, of how they should implement something securely if it's for developers or really for pen testers, what they should be covering when they're assessing an app. Together with this comes, of course, the mobile security testing guide. And this is really um, a very, very detailed and huge <laughs> cookbook nowadays. Over the last six years, I think over 100 volunteers um, have more or less made a brain dump um, into the MSTG. So there are a lot of really cool um, tips and tricks and also really um, um, the technical details of how you can verify the requirements of the MASVS. I think if you would print it at the moment, it might be roughly 800 pages. So it's really a lot of um, good, um, 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 good technical details in it. So it's really possible for you to verify a lot of things for Android, for iOS, and it really goes very deep and also is um, suggesting the various security best practices that um, we would like to share with everybody. 
Besides these two things, we also have the mobile security testing checklist. So this is something that we were uh, maintaining already since the beginning of the project, but um, it had become quite tedious and error prone over the years because we were maintaining it uh, manually. So um, Carlos was actually creating a really neat um, Python script around it, which is basically scrapping um, the important information from the MASVS and MSTG. So both are GitHub repos where the whole documents are stored as markdown. The Python script is pulling all this information and is then creating this beautiful new um, Excel sheet that you can see here on the right side. So it's also amazing that we have um, in total 13 different languages for the MASVS. And um, with this Python script that Carlos has done, it's now possible for us to automate the whole process. And we basically have now um, the mobile security testing checklist therefore also in all the languages available where the MASVS is also available. So we have a variety of languages from Chinese to Spanish to Portuguese. Um, so if you're non English, if you're, if you're not a native speaker from English, then most likely you will find your native language nowadays in the MASVS, which is also a great community effort that we're really um, grateful for. Then, um, I think this just is um, give you an understanding around what we are producing with the project. And then I would hand over um, to Carlos for now for Google's other. Thanks. So, well, actually two, uh, two quick notes here. So one is also that the testing guide um, is for everyone. Well, all of our documents, they have a broad audience. So any of you, no matter if you're app architect or developer, uh, you should find your way into this. So we are making it uh, as easy as possible for you to, to understand uh, what it's important when you should test a mobile app. So um, the other thing is about the checklists that um, they are one of our most beloved resources. Um, and thanks to automation, we will we have improved them a lot and we will improve them even more. So as you can imagine, since it's an Excel document, uh, might not be scalable in some uh, situations, but stay until the end and we will give you an update uh, on that. So, but going to the next topic. Um, so this is about um, privacy and we will end up with security. So um, a question to you all, uh, have you ever read the privacy policy of the apps? How often do you do that? So normally uh, the, the Play Store or the App Store for, Android, um, for iOS, they require the developers to publish it, but you as a user would have to read these big documents. So to help with this and make things easier, uh, iOS has started uh, the privacy nutrition labels so you can imagine this as uh, when you buy organic food or well any food and you have a score how healthy it is so here is kind of an easy way and quick way for anyone without any technical knowledge to understand what the app is requiring from you so uh, apple was the first one in 2020 to do that you can see this in the in the left picture and android followed that Google. So um, Google has released this data privacy and security section and Google Play, which you can check whenever you want to download an app and you will get similar information at first, like if the app is requiring your location, your some of your personal information wants to access the contacts. So there are a few other things like if the app follows some uh, security best practices as encrypting the data or allows you to delete your data. So if the app uh, cares for privacy. So actually there is more than this. So this is very nice. And we are really happy that uh, Apple and Google started this, but there's something else about Google in the next slide. So if you want to go one step further, as a developer, as a company making an app, you will be able to showcase your privacy and security best practices, not only this way, but by following a global standard, which is the one that we are presenting to you today, the MESVS. So 
if you would like to get this little um, batch that you are seeing in the left side, highlighted in green, um, you should do an independent review of your code, like security review, uh, when with one of the authorized labs. So if you do so, you will be able to get this batch in your Google Play. And this is great because you will be showing that you care for security and privacy and you are following a, a security global standards such as the MESVS. In order to do this test, uh, you will also have to follow uh, the testing according to the MSDG. So um, this is a really great step uh, made by Google. And we are really happy that uh, we can provide our standard to the whole world and the whole Android smartphone. So yeah, next slide. Okay, thank you, Carlos. So um, now we will be talking more about the OVASP MASVS refactoring process. So just before we starting with this, I also want to say a huge thanks to Hirun Beckers, who is um, continuously supporting us also as part of this exercise. He was really from uh, was always doing great support for us throughout the whole process. But um, let me just give you an idea about how this refactoring process was actually taking place. So initially, um, we have eight different domains. So this is um, what we have at the moment in the MASVS. As you can see here in these blue boxes in the middle, MASVS network, crypto storage. So all of these different domains um, we have at the moment. And what we did is we created um, a mind map with all of these domains and the requirements of these domains. And we were um, discussing all of them in detail through just with the intention to really be crystal clear around what this requirement actually means. Um, if we can actually map a test case also to this requirement, if we might need to merge requirements, if we need to split requirements, if we maybe need to remove them, maybe they do not make much sense after um, our experience now after for so long, and also after collecting feedback from many others that are using the MASVS. So we were really open to completely um, start from scratch, see what we have and how we can really shape this into this um, version 2.0. So we also had a lot of people um, that were also giving feedback um, during the whole process. So really all of, also thanks to everyone that has already contributed to this. So, but let me give you um, an idea how this was then also um, being done in more detail. So you can see here um, on the left side, we are using GitHub discussions, a new feature that was introduced by GitHub last year. And this is how we are driving um, this change that we're doing with the MASVS because we want to be as transparent also as possible so that the community and everybody um, can be engaged and that everybody is also knowing what is actually happening with the project and with the requirements and within the MASVS. So that's why we're going through it step by step, every domain and for every domain, um, the changes that we are going through would therefore be published. So let me show you just first um, the discussions so you can see here, this is the current discussions that we're having in our GitHub um, repo from the MASVS. So the latest one um, that was being published was MASVS code. So just um, the comments were, or the this was just closed end of last month. And so it was is usually open for one month for, um, for comments. And you can see here, this is the outcome of the refactoring process of the code domain now. So we have six different um, requirements that you can see here. And um, there is here then an Excel sheet tied to it. And you can see here on top what has actually changed to the current um, requirements that are part of the MESVS code. What is read was being removed or here in this case, you can see that a requirement was changed. So the wording was changed. So meaning um, we were really going then the extra mile therefore to really make it as transparent as possible to really make it traceable also back to the old version, including um, a lot of all the information um, that we had at this point, of, point in time and the thought process, meaning the outcome of our discussions on why we are thinking that, for example, this requirement should be removed, why it might be merged, why it might be split, and to really have it as transparent as possible so that it's really um, possible for everybody to see at any point in time on why certain things have been done. 
So this Excel sheet is then um, open for comment. Everybody can give their comment and we got also a lot of good comments in terms to just um, tidy it up maybe a little bit or still to um, get rid of some phrases that we might want to revert. So therefore this was now very good approach to really get feedback from the community and um, get also the buy-in from the community so that we're not doing anything in a black box for a year and then we're just throwing it out to the public but to really involve everybody. And therefore the platform that we have now um, with GitHub discussions is therefore um, of course perfect. So um, another example is the MASDS storage um, that we will be making a deep dive into later also. So you can see here at the moment there are five different um, requirements and the same as with the coding, you can see that for um, the storage part, we also had quite a few changes. And the storage part is also a bit more complex because it's simply so many different ways of where data can be stored and where data might be available. And you can see also for this, um, there's a lot of different changes that have happened. And also with, um, you can see here in this column, um, example tests that we could think of, of what might be test cases also in the MSTG. So there's a lot of thought that has been put into this, and especially from Carlos, who was um, preparing many, many times um, these, these detailed overviews for everybody. So therefore, um, this is really giving a great transparency um, into the project itself. Just go back. Okay. So therefore, um, this is about the starting process and the thought process and how we were executing it and how we were also involving the community, community into it. So then, um, yeah, over to you, Carlos. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this has been a really big effort, but it was definitely, uh, it is being very worth it. And if you deep dive into those sheets, uh, you will find a lot of valuable information and uh, this information uh, we will use also in the future, not only to, to uh, get this refactoring ready, but also as you, are, uh, as you saw, we are also collecting new ideas for tests. So the tests that we are uh, already having in the MSTG, they are uh, partially listed on there, but we are also collecting new ideas for tests. So we don't want to miss a thing in this process. And we are, um, yeah, taking everything in consideration. So from the ground up, and um, so that you can better understand this, um, we have prepared the, the next slides, which explains a little bit into more detail uh, the process. So and um, let's start with this one. Yeah, the storage one. So. Uh, a tendency that you will see in general in the new controls is that we have made them shorter. So our intention is to abstract them a little bit so that they are also uh, a bit easier to understand. So we will be avoiding things like, as you, as you can see here, uh, store sensitive data such as PEI, user credentials. We won't give we won't be given any examples inside the control itself. So that's one thing we will do. So, but specifically to this control, what we have seen is that, okay, first we start mentioning the system credential storage facilities. What is this? That's first. So we know that in Android and in iOS, we have the, the keychain and the key store. So most of the people has, uh, have interpreted this as exactly that but it's not really clear because you have other places in the system or other facilities such as the android account manager so to uh, avoid this confusion we have been uh, fixing this we have fixed the terminology that we are using we instead of saying keychain and key store or system credential storage facilities we will be saying key store a platform key store which refers to both as a common term. And this will be explained in the MESVS. So now we will include for this kind of terms also an explanation. So if you read the control and it should be clear, if it's not, you can read this little paragraph on each of the terms and it should be clear. And then we will leave the details for the MSTG. So, um, 
just the, the, the last point I want to mention for the first one is that we also mentioned the uh, sensitive data and um, such as PII. In this case, PII might be, I don't know, your uh, address, your postal address or something like that. So it's something that in principle is not meant to be in a keychain or in a key store, even if unofficially the keychain on iOS allows for that but you cannot do that with a key store. Instead, you would encrypt this information. So the key here is that we need information being encrypted, properly encrypted somewhere. If you take a look at the second one, uh, again mentions that no sensitive data should be stored, not only outside the system credential storage facilities, but also includes the app container. So uh, this overlaps with the first one, this is another point, general point we consider in the refactoring, the overlapping between controls in the MSVS, but also maybe between standards even, such as the ASVS. So in this case, the problem is not the storage, but the lack of encryption once again, and the overlapping. So, and sometimes the data must live outside these places. So what do we do? We have to encrypt it. That will be the spoiler here. And another example, storage 13. So this one, um, again, tells you that the data must be locally or should be stored locally. No, sorry, <laughs> no sensitive data should be stored locally. So you should just get it from the backend and leave it in memory. Um, that is more an architectural thing. So then we have that and we have that it also overlaps with one and two just kind of forcing you to have it only uh, in the back end. So to put more a bit of order here in, in all of this, we have uh, started this, this refactoring. So the next thing we have considered, just as also as general things um, here, is that the architecture, um, architectural uh, considerations on each of the categories, in this case, um, for storage, we have to consider that data might be indeed only local, might be in the remote endpoint, but usually will be in both. So you would have such an hybrid architecture for your data. And the other point is the scope. So uh, on each of the categories, now we will clearly uh, present the scope. And in the case of, um, so that you have an idea, in the case of storage, this is the scope of the MESV storage category. User data, so sensitive data, of course, but what is sensitive data? It's user data, authorization and authentication data, and cryptographic material. This is everything we are considering in our controls. And to give you even a better idea of what we consider user data, you can see here this big list which actually comes from Google, and you can also find an equi equivalent one on, on iOS. So let's take a closer look. So first, uh, we have 15 requirements. So some of them we already presented now, but we have many others regarding sensitive data being in log files, in the keyboard cache, uh, sent over IPC, leaking via the UI, on backups, on being in the memory. Um, so everything you can see here. And just the first spoiler is this gets boiled down to five requirements, which come exactly there. And now we will explain how we came from the 15 to the five requirements. So the first step was to identify what was actually in other categories. So we have another category, which is MSV platform, which is about uh, how the app interacts with the platform, that is Android or iOS, or capabilities that the systems uh, provide. So in this case, the app is, or the developer is not actually storing kind of voluntarily or intentionally data. It's kind of the data gets somehow stored some way. So we have identified all of this about the IPC mechanisms where you are 
sending information but not actually storing it the keyboard cache the ui so all of this uh, we actually consider to be in platform so we will be removing them from here and moving them to platform and the other one is the crypto one which also uh, uh, removed and moved to uh, crypto actually as a test case which is about uh, keys being hard ba uh, hardware baked uh, stored in the hardware baked storage and having also or requiring user authentication so this was a bit uh, a kind of a complex requirement we have cut it in little pieces and put it to crypto wherever it belonged so uh, this was the first step so the next one it's about what was more obvious when defining the new control so we took what was left and said okay what actually makes sense First, the problem I mentioned before, that actually the lack of encryption was the issue, not exactly where the data was. So that's why we came up with the first requirement on storage, that sensitive data is stored in encrypted form. With this, we cover for everything, and then we let the MSDG define what do you need according to the different scope. So you will be able to find uh, data stored in the app container, outside the app container. Usually people talk about internal and external storage, but that that is right, but there's more to that. So an app, it would be right to store data wherever an app has exclusive access so that no other apps um, can store data in there. That could be also in the external storage, but um, on Android, for instance, if you use scoped storage, but you should be careful if you consider a rooted smartphone as a threat. In that case, you wouldn't be compliant here. So, um, yeah, so for the rest, this is what we did. So the second requirement was more clearly about, um, sorry, the first requirement was clearly about the platform key store. The second requirement was about the encryption. Then the third requirement, the logs, was pretty obvious, and the memory as well. And um, the last one about privacy uh, also, so it's that you follow the best practices, etc. We just reformulated uh, a little bit. And by the way, also started a chapter on the MSDG on um, data privacy that will keep growing with time. But uh, right now, we already include the information that we mentioned before about the ADA, Google, and the privacy label, labels from, from Apple. And the last step, as you can see here, we took the rest of them and noticed that they could be covered as tests. So we just uh, converted them to tests for each of the requirements on the right side, as you can see now. So that was it from me from now for now. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Then um, let me follow up with the next part of it. So we have seen that there's really a lot going on in terms of um, the different requirements and how they are now shifted around, how Carlos was just explaining how they've been merged. Um, maybe they actually should be put into different categories. So this means that um, at the end of the day, we really want to have a clear um, articulation of the requirements. And also this would of course need to map to the um, MSTG test cases. So you can see here on the left side, these are actually the old MSTG, MSTG storage one and MSTG storage two requirements. And this was one huge test case that we're having in the MSTG. And when we were going through the refactoring of the um, MASVS, we also realized that it would make sense to really have um, maybe called it atomic tests to these kind of different um, re uh, requirements like the MASVS storage one. As Carlos was just outlining, there were requirements that would actually be test cases um, of this requirement. So therefore, it really makes sense to structure the whole thing in a way <clears throat> so that we have really these encapsulated and um, test cases that are really explicit about one specific topic instead of having everything in one large test case and in, in the as in the current MSTG where we even 
grouping requirements together in one test case, <clears throat> because this means that we're really um, on the wrong track there and it simply becomes too big, <clears throat> excuse me, and it becomes too big. So therefore we, re we really need to break it down. So another um, benefit of doing this whole exercise and ending up with this atomic test cases is that um, it's then also easier to automate them because if something is smaller, then of course the test case should become less complex. And at the end of the day, we want to drive, of course, more automation. And by grouping this or by splitting everything in these kind of atomic test cases, we really build the structure or also the foundation for more automation. Because at the end of the day, we can then try to come up with different regular expressions, maybe different kind of rules for open source SaaS or DAS tools to support the whole automation of these test cases and therefore keep also the knowledge around it open. So just not a thought process and maybe the technical steps, but really something on how this can be automatically also um, verified. So let me show you on the next slide also how we put all this together then the tests and the controls and how everything is then related for storage. So you can see now here in the middle, um, the blue boxes, these are now the five different um, requirements or controls that Carlos um, was just explaining. And you can see um, in the bottom, the yellow boxes, all the different test cases. So there might still be changes, of course, happening to this. At the moment, it's just this, this is um, the current draft. And you can see that for storage one, storage two, also for four and five, there might be usually more tests than just one. Just where MESVS storage three, where we are testing um, log files for sensitive information, this might then um, be one test case. And you have the key areas on top, just to understand how everything is then um, being mapped. So we have data addressed, data in use, and then of course all data, all data is then covering um, the privacy of course for everything. But the data addressed, we can of course split it into various other areas because sensitive information can basically be everywhere, right? It can be a new code, it can be in the third party libraries that you might be using, it can be internal storage, external storage, then even in the key store, of course, how is actually the data being stored or how are the keys properly protected when the data is being encrypted? So all of these kind of things um, would need to be broken down into different test cases to simply make the testing easier and therefore on the long run then also um, build the foundation for the automation. Then over to you again, Carlos. Yeah. So one note also on this one, uh, we will be also including, um, well, if we have the time, we hope we really do, a lot of such diagrams so that uh, we really believe this uh, can make things easier to understand. So we will try to include a lot of uh, graphics um, that help you follow the tests and the controls and yeah, maybe having it more visual so we have simplified everything but also having visuals might also help following up so yeah we're really excited about this new version of the MESVS so and um, before I was talking about scalability and how when you use the checklists they might not be really scalable in some situations but if you have a small team, just testing one app might be okay. Um, so we would like to make everything really smooth and easy to use. And the thing is that uh, unfortunately, still today, um, most of the standards, they are not really uh, very dynamic or interactive. So as you might expect, so we are growing a lot in this um, as code, tendency and um, automating things but when you talk about standards and certifications it's not really the case so you need a human you have many kind of kinds of documents like words pdfs excel tables etc so you really need a person to read that interpret the results interpret the controls and maintain everything so you um, it's often very hard to prove that you uh, uh, comply to that standard and it's uh, difficult also to compare them 
they might be might be overlapping as well and yeah the whole thing is difficult to maintain so um we want to change this and we want to go from this static documents to more dynamic and interactive uh, documents and uh we will be using automation as we already started doing with the checklists and we will extend this to make the MESVS and the MSDG both um, dynamic and interactive documents. So the first obvious thing is making it uh, machine readable. So you will be able to retrieve the current MESVS, including the version, all the controls and all the related tests in the end. This will make things much easier for you to prove that you comply with the standard because you're, you can put it in your CI CD pipelines and uh, your testing systems. And um, another interesting point here that we think uh, will be very useful for um, app developers or companies developing apps when they are searching for testing providers, that they have a way to uh, benchmark them. So um the last thing also well there may, might be more things but uh, one thing we are considering also here is the importance of traceability so you will be able to trace back your results to any version of the MESVS that was used for testing so and um to complete that so well first we are calling this compliance as code we didn't invent this term we just uh, found it and thought this is exactly what we are doing. And um, we really think this will have a huge impact on how you will be using your, our standard. And um, the first thing we will do is to, to provide different um, so-called profiles. Uh, until now, we were offering you the level one, level two, and R for resilience. So we will be introducing these levels as profiles. So. The MSVS standard will provide you at least with these three, such as a baseline for different levels of security or better set, better set uh, threat modeling. And we will be able to easily enhance this to uh, so that you can fully tailor your testing because we know every app is different and we know that has different needs. So maybe you would like to test just for privacy so we will be kind of marking our privacy related controls in the MESVS. You will be able to filter them and just test for that. You might be interested into just the controls that are automation friendly. So you will be able to also to propose which ones you think you are, they are like this. Uh, so this will be a community effort, of course. So we, you can ask us, you can propose things. We will also propose things. And um, we will also do it cross standards. A uh, good example is the ASVS. We have the authorization and authentication category in the MSVS, which we saw highly uh, overlaps with the ASVS. So we will separate in them clearly, offering you in the MSVS only the mobile things that you can test. And we will uh, use these profiles to connect back to the ASVS. So you can have a full testing of both standards. And uh, yeah, this can be applicable to other kind of like different kind of apps like IoT apps, health apps. So there are also other uh, standards for that that are also using the MESVS. So we will provide this framework that will allow to easily mix and match all the controls cross standard and cross projects. So we are really excited about this. Uh, we can tell you though when it's been released, but at least you have to wait until we release the version two of the MSVS. Okay, so here, um, please get in touch. Um, here you have all our possible contact information from us. Uh, follow us on, on the, the project or us as well uh, on Twitter. Um, if you have any questions, you can join our Slack. You can check our repos, which are here listed and linked, um, our official OWASP page, and then you can reach us uh, individually also if you want, or email, LinkedIn, 
or wherever you want. And yeah, we'd love like to thank you a lot, invite you to contribute and connect with us. Um, yeah, there are many different ways to contribute. You might not know, might be as easy as fixing some typos while you're reading. It might be reviewing the PRs. Maybe you, you're very technical and you would like to do that. You are an Android developer and would like to improve our crackmes or propose a new one. Um, constantly, there are new hacking tools being released. So we test them all before publishing them in, and recommending them in the MSDG. Please help us out, out with that because there are so many things. Um, and yeah, answer discussion. So, or just simply ask us, tell us about you and we can find you the right ticket that you can work on. So Sven, anything to add? No, I think just thanks for the invite. And I think then um, over to you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, guys, for introduction. Uh, there is directly one question uh, regarding the ETA of the availability of the updated standard. You mentioned it a couple of times that it will be coming soon. Ish? Yeah, so <laughs> um, we have covered, uh, as Sven showed, maybe Sven, you can show this light. It was seven. Um, until code right now. And um, yeah. well, first, our first disclaimer might be that this is a community effort and voluntary work. Uh, so this, uh, we cannot ensure completely that we will uh, make it as planned. But until now, we have been having a very good pace of one month per category. So you can expect if we are now in June, July, August, September, more or less. So plus maybe one month that we will release the, um, the release candidate, open it for comments. So you will have another chance to comment on the whole thing. And then we will again review that, release another candidate, maybe by the end of the year uh, we will have or January, I don't know, maybe this version too. This would be another invitation to people to contribute, then maybe it goes faster. Exactly. So please. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly. We do have also some companies uh, contributing, such as uh, Now Secure, uh, really investing a lot of time. So we would like to really thank them. Also, the ADA group from Google, they have been providing awesome feedback and many other people. So we also accept definitely companies uh, providing time, not just money, which is also great, but uh, yeah, to accelerate this effort, uh, we really need a lot, of, a lot of hands here. And another question, um, I took a look on the polls and people are answering that they're going to introduce the standard and the testing guide and on that uh, from your experience how much time does it take to get something like that established in the organization or in dev team mm, i guess that depends of course really on how big the organization is i mean at, at the end of the day what what at least i could see at some of our customers that we had here in singapore also is that especially if something new is happening meaning they um, either have internally a new project might want to redo their whole app and they're anyway starting from scratch then it's quite easy to get these kind of um, standards also into and there were also projects for example in the past where we were also injected um, meaning myself or uh, others from our team and then it's pretty easy to when you're part of the engineering team to just articulate the correct requirements at the end of the day they always get the correct functional requirements but not really the correct security requirements because it's always just to get something up and running quickly so therefore i would say if it's a project that it's starting new then it's rather easy as long as you have a security person around to maybe utilize the masvs and just define on what is actually applicable and what not and with the excel checklist for example they can just note down the reasoning on why certain things we might not want to implement 
doing this now organization wide is of course a huge um, um, effort in order to understand what is now really a requirement for the organization and whatnot so that can take of course significant amount of time but what i could see in the past is that the masvs was actually being used like as a blueprint which is of course a great um, um, success also for the project because then it already gives the baseline and then there just might be some tweaking needed and some of the requirements that what might need to be skipped and maybe some need to be added but i think it's always um, a good skeleton and a good starting point um, regardless if it's now a small project or enterprise but to roll out these kind of things of course will take time then for bigger enterprises thank you then there are no more questions asked in the q a and with that i would really love to thank you for the presentation for the extreme amount of work that you are doing to increase our awareness about the mobile security and the next uh, talk in this track will be the understanding the complete chain of application security using one open sre.org so those of you who want to join please do that and with that thank you very much sven and carlos and keep up the great work you're doing and let's hope that there will be more people coming to contribute Perfect. thank you thank you so much have a great conference. Bye. Thank you. Bye.